We're talking today about reigning true righteousness. Romans 5 verse 17 said, If by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more, much more, they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. And this is a fact. That they which, much more, they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in this life, and another version says, as kings, by virtue of that one Jesus Christ, by virtue of what he did, by virtue of his sacrifice. So it's an issue of receiving that abundance of grace. And we know that that grace is available. We have found out that we already have received abundance of grace. In fact, when the Bible speaks about that we might be to the praise of his glory, it is speaking about that grace and that exceeding greatness of his unsurpassing kindness which he has already bestowed upon us amen so that abundance of grace is available and we got it that righteousness is available and we got it jesus is the grace of god jesus is the righteousness of god jesus is made on to us everything that we could ever need and uh, we've been talking that 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 we need to have a comprehension of what righteousness is and there's basically four aspects to righteousness one Right standing, which includes um, being free from guilt and condemnation and insecurity and, and fear and, and so on and shame. And the second aspect is, is the authority that we have by being one with him. The, and that authority is expressed in the name of Jesus. The third aspect is this oneness that we have with God in Christ. And then the fourth aspect is the rights and the privileges that we have as, as, um, as, as, as being the righteousness of God in Christ. Now... We also found out that grace reigns through righteousness. So that when you function in righteousness, the abundance of grace will, will, will flow. It will be made manifest. So we found out that, that, that the abundance of grace is available. We've got it. The righteousness is available. It's given unto us as a gift. And as we function in our righteousness, the grace flows. But we also, we also recognize that if, if we don't receive this and if we don't function in these things, it's not going to just happen. The reigning is not going to take place. But we also got this wonderful, great insight that we can function in that righteousness by applying the sacrifice of Christ. And this whole day today is about this. It is to understand what are those aspects of the sacrifice of Christ. And as we continue, what are the, the eight applications of the sacrifice of Christ and how those specific applications can cause each of these um, aspects of righteousness to become a reality to become experiential in our lives amen so that is where we're at right now now um so let's pick up from there and go on turn with me to titus chapter 2 so we want to we want to know how to apply the sacrifice of christ so that we could be established in righteousness and reign in life through christ jesus amen no matter what comes our way in fact, you know, <laughs> thinking about what could come our way. From a natural standpoint, all kinds of rough stuff could come our way. But then how does the Word see it? How does God see it? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and from about verse, 7, verse 17, it says, Paul said, this light affliction is but for a moment. And it worked within us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things that are not seen. Paul says, and Paul called what he was experiencing at that time, a light affliction. Now that's very interesting, because Paul was shipwrecked, Paul was beaten with rods, Paul was left, was, was left floating <laughs> in, in the ocean for days, Paul was... Um, Paul was, was threatened with death so many times. One time he literally got stoned to death. We believe he was raised up, got up and went back into, the, went back into town. Paul had all kinds of extreme persecution and, and, and difficult things happen. And the Paul that was having all, Paul was thrown in jail. And Paul wrote most of the epistles from in jail. And he says, this light affliction, he called it light affliction. I think that's very important because your perspective makes a big difference. Don't make, the mountain, don't make a molehill into a mountain. You look at the mountain and call it a molehill. Amen? 
So Paul, Paul says, this light affliction is but for a moment. And it will work a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. Not automatically. How? If while we, while we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things that are not seen. Where is your attention? What are you fixated on? The enemy brings up problems and he, want us to, he wants to grab our attention and he wants us to keep reacting to what he is doing. He wants to control us. He wants us to speak from that problem, from that situation, from that challenge, from that conflict, when all the time, and, and to do that, that's a dysfunction. Because we're not supposed to be operating from there. We're supposed to be operating from where we are in Christ. We are supposed to be speaking from where we are, seated in heavenly places in Christ. We are supposed to be speaking from where we are, abiding in Jesus. Not in the situation. Anyway, that's, that's, a, that's, that's a tremendous thing in and of itself. But I said that to say, to say what? To say that um, your perspective, how do you see things? Where are we functioning from? Where are we functioning from? We are to function from where we are in Christ. Titus chapter 2. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Titus chapter 2. Now that's just before Hebrews. Before Philemon. Amen. So God wants you to function in righteousness. God wants you to be established in it. God don't want you to be moved. So that no matter what the problem is, we, where we are, we have so much light that it can drive that darkness out. No matter how big the situation might seem, we have an answer. We can reign through righteousness. Amen? Now Titus chapter 2 and verse 11 says, We can reign through righteousness, and righteousness, we can be established in it, by means of applying the sacrifice. All right. Titus chapter 2 verse 11. Glory to God. It says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation had appeared unto all men. The grace of God that bringeth salvation had appeared unto all men. It was God's grace and love that came up with this whole salvation plan. What was this salvation plan? What was this great salvation plan that God had in mind from the foundation of the world? The Bible says Jesus was slain from what? Before the foundation of the world. Now I want you to begin to think about the sacrifice of Christ. Think sacrifice, think righteousness. Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. This was the plan that God had from the foundation of the world to redeem mankind. So it says here that the grace of God that brought salvation, the love of God, the grace of God that came up with this idea that brought salvation. How did he do this? John chapter 3 verse 16. We all know that verse, don't we? For God so loved the world that he what? Gave his only begotten son. Is that talking about the sacrifice of Christ? Absolutely. So Jesus also said, in, um, you don't need to turn to it, but in Hebrews chapter 10, Jesus said from verse 5 to about verse 10, a body you have prepared for me. Sacrifice and offering, the bulls, the blood of bulls and goats, that did not please you, that did not accomplish what you desire. So a body you have prepared for me, and I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me, I come to do your will. Isn't that right? What was he talking about? He was talking about himself being the Lamb of God, being the sacrifice of Christ. John the Baptist says, John 1, 29, when Jesus went by, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. What were we talking about? The sacrifice of Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, it says, We are redeemed not with corruptible things as silver and gold from our vain conversation that we received from our forefathers, but we've been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb who was without spot or without blemish. Amen? So again, all those, so it was the grace of God and the love of God that brought forth Jesus to be the sacrifice, to be the scapegoat, to be the Lamb of God. God made salvation available to all men. Grace makes salvation available to all men, but it's only, but you receive it by faith. We are saved by grace, how? Through faith. Similarly, righteousness, now this is going to matter. And this is going to matter especially when we start 
when we desire to reach our family and to reach the lost, we're going to need to understand that what God did for us, hear this, what God did for you, what God did for me, what God did for every born again child of God, he did for every single human, human being. Amen? And later on, we will also find out that what God did with us, he also did with them too. They just don't know about it. And if we don't tell them, they can die and go to hell, even though the price has totally been paid for them. Amen? So, this salvation is available to all men, but it only comes upon you when you believe. Righteousness is available up to all men, Romans 3, 22, 21 and 22, but it only comes upon those that believe. What did God do? Jesus lived a perfect... Now, let's see, we're gonna, you're going to hear the sacrifice here. Jesus lived a perfect sinless life and by so doing that perfect walk that he had that perfect sinless life qualified him to be the lamb of god without spot or blemish even when he was in a mock trial with, with Pilate and so on even then when he, when, when he was being asked questions to defend himself the bible says he refused to defend himself why did he refuse to, to, to defend himself? Because if he had given in to that and started defending himself, he would have been looking out for himself. And to look out for himself is to yield to the spirit of offense, which the devil is behind. And so Jesus opened not his mouth. Why? Because if he had done that, he would have disqualified himself from being the Lamb of God. I'm saying that to say he was the perfect, spotless Lamb of God without blemish. He was a perfect sacrifice. You and I have been redeemed from a, by a perfect sacrifice. And while we're at it, you are, the, you are the perfect result coming out of that sacrifice. You are called his workmanship. Amen? Blessed be the name of the Lord. So here Jesus lived a perfect life, qualified to, 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 be, our, to be the Lamb of God. And then what? He was crucified, number one. Number two, he was buried. Number three, he was resurrected. Number four, he, was, uh, he ascended into heaven and sat on the right hand of the Father. Number five, he shed his blood. Number six, he also um, gave us his life. So that when you are born again, the Bible says, what makes you different from any other religion, from any other people that are claiming whatever, is the fact that it's God that lives on the inside of you. It's Christ in you. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You are not a believer or born again because you go to church any more than you are a vehicle because you park in a garage. Hello? Going to church don't make you a Christian, right? Memorizing the creed don't make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian? Uh, what, 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 what makes you an authentic Christian? What validates you as a Christian before heaven is Christ in you. Is God living on the inside of us? So number six then is God living inside of us. It's part of that sacrifice. And then number seven, it is the name of Jesus and the authority of that name. And then number, number eight is the, the great and precious promises that are given unto us. We've been given great and precious promises. Now, just as a hint right now, I'm going to come. We're going to come back and see how you have a part in everything that Jesus did. Everything. Crucifixion, burial, resurrection, everything. We'll come back to that. Turn me to Hebrews chapter 9. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 12. It says, Neither by the blood of bulls and goats, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained obtained eternal redemption for us. He purchased redemption for us. Jesus died not only for our sins, he died for our sins. But watch this, he was raised up so that we can have his life. Amen? He died for our sins, but he was raised up that we might have his life. Turn with me the first piece of John chapter 4, verse 9. And this is a verse of scripture you want to mark in your Bible. First John chapter 4, verse 9. It says, And in this was manifested the love of God. Now you read back in Romans, it, it says, Here is the love of God manifested, 
that God, that God loved us, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And that is a manifestation of the love of God, isn't it? But here it says, in this was manifested the love of God towards us. Because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world. Why? That we might live through Him. That we might have His life. Amen? So Jesus died for our sins. But He was also raised up so that we can have His life. And He can live in us and through us. Romans 5 verse 9 says the same thing. So what, what, what happened here? What happened here? Jesus, by His death... Listen to this. Put an end to the old man, the old life, and the human limitations that came as a result of Adam's fall. Jesus put an end to those things so that those things are not to rule you anymore. That is what it's talking about when it says, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. And then it says what? Old things have what? passed away all things have become all those old things that have passed away is putting an end to you to the old man to, to his deeds to 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 um to the limitations that were attached to to being restricted in, in this realm of humanity do you know you have access you know as believers we've got access to god amen and quite frankly, we also got access to the devil. Furthermore, we have access to people. Ephesians chapter 3 and I think verse 11 and 12. Verse 12, I believe it is. We've got access. Say, I got access. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. So, by Jesus' death, he put an end to certain things. And by his resurrection and ascension, he brought certain things into being. He brought, he, he brought a new life. For you and I, a new life, and a new life that you have in Christ is beyond your wildest dreams. It's better than you could have ever come up with. Amen. And the more we begin to discover what it is. And let me say something. <laughs> Everything that a new man is, he is. <laughs> All right. That's really deep. <laughs> All right. The, the, the new man is... He's not changing. He is so tremendously blessed with the very life of God, the very essence of God, the very, the, the very essence of his being is Christ. And, I mean, he doesn't have to change. He is already perfect. The Bible says that we have been perfected forever. I think it's Hebrews 10 and verse 14. Right? The Bible calls it in another place. I think it's Hebrews 12 and possibly verse 23. The spirit of just men made perfect. It says we are created in righteousness and true holiness. That means you can't be any more holy, you can't be any more righteous than the righteousness of God. That's what your spirit man looks like. But now what happens is, as we grow and as we, and as we increase in learning and in understanding and get comprehension and revelation, we are only discovering and unveiling who and what we already are. We are not trying to become. We already are. We are just, un we are just finding out. Say, I want to find out some more. Amen? All right. So here, in this, by his resurrection, the Bible says, this new man has come up. You are God's workmanship created in righteousness and true holiness. And there are pathways that God has designed for you to walk in. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. The Bible says this, what came up out of the resurrection and ascension is such that as Jesus is, so are you in this world. So here's a good question. How did God do this? How did he do it? Wouldn't you like to know? Right, turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. How did God do this? How did he put an end to all that I was and give me a brand new start? So that all things have become new and all things are of God. What is that all about? What all things have become new? What old things have passed away? Colossians chapter 2. How did he do it? Colossians chapter 2 verse 12. Now I realize this reads slightly different in various versions. But I'm going to stick here to the old King James. It says. Um, in whom also you are. Verse 11. In whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. 
in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him, buried with Christ in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him. So you are buried with Christ in baptism, and you are risen with him. How? Through the faith of the operation of God, who had raised him from the dead. That scripture says, you were buried with Christ, you were risen with Christ, and it says God did it by the faith of his operation. It's like God did some supernatural divine surgery. He did it, and it was his faith. Do you believe God has enough faith? All right. Now, what did, let, let, let's see what, he, what is it he did. Let's flip over. Keep your finger there. In Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 3. It says, Know you not that as many of you as been baptized into Christ, immersed into Christ, tie died with him. Now, I like the word tie die. Right, because the word baptism, is, it has to do with tie die. You know when you tie die something, man, you, you can't separate it. You were tie died with him. Where? Where were you tied out with him? No, you not. Don't you know this? You need to know this. You need to know this. Know what? That you were tied out, baptized into Jesus, and you were baptized into his death. If you were tied out with him and you were baptized into his death, when he died, you died. Amen? It continues. Therefore, you were also buried. I like the burial part. You know why? You get rid of the body. <laughs> Therefore you are buried with him by baptism into death. And like as Christ was raised up from the dead. Now you know it's going to say in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 5 and 6 that you were raised up together with him and made to sit together with him in heavenly places. Right? And that you have joined seated with Christ. Ephesians 2 verse 5 and 6. So you were raised up together with him by the glory of the Father. Even so, well, think about it. You were buried with him. You died with him. You were buried with him. You were resurrected with him. And we're going to know from all the scriptures, you were made to sit together with him. Well, hey, you ought to walk in this new life that you have. Shouldn't you? So it says you ought to walk in this newness of life, in this resurrected life. And then it continues talking some more. Here's the point. The point of the matter is this is what God did. He did it with you and I, but he did it with the entire human race. Everyone. How do I know that? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 says, The love of Christ constrains us. And this is what we judge. That if one died for all. Who's all? Christians only know all is all. If one died for all, then we're all dead. So what happened is, this is what God did. God took Jesus. You see, Jesus never committed sin, did he? Did he commit sin? No. But he was made to be sin. How did he do that? By faith. You never commit righteousness, but you were made righteous. Is that right? God, he's God, man. Jesus has faith. God has faith. Their faith is untouchable. Yes. Amen. Jesus had enough faith to be able to drink that cup and took on our, our sins, sickness, and all of that. And God had enough faith to take you and I and the entire human race and place us in Christ. So that when he died, everyone died with him, was buried with him, raised up with him, and made to sit together with him in heavenly places. Now what happened is, you and I, when we got born again, we just received the package. Amen? Amen? The people that die and go to hell, they didn't receive the package. That's why you need to tell them, this is good news. God is not holding your sins and trespasses against you. But God was in Christ reconciling you unto himself. The price is already paid. Why are you living on a needed dominion of the devil? You don't have to stay in this kingdom of darkness. You don't have to be dominated by sickness and disease, poverty and lack of oppression and depression and all the works of hell. You can be set free and receive what's already paid for, what's already yours by receiving this good news and making Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life that is why the Bible says we are ambassadors as if God was beseeching them through us be reconciled unto God and the word reconciled means come on accept the exchange accept the exchange he became poor that you might be rich he became sin that you might be righteous he became he became sickness that you might be healed he became 
rejected of God that you might be accepted. Are you with me? He took the punishment and the wrath that you might be blessed. He became the curse that you might have the blessing of the Lord. That's the good news. And that has been done for every single human being. But it only comes upon those that believe. But how shall they believe without a preacher? How shall they hear if somebody don't tell them? Are you with me? But when, so if they go to hell, it's not because of their sins. It's because of not receiving God's gift and not receiving Christ. You understand that? All right. So, but God, this, in this operation, God placed us in Christ, and we went through the whole process with Jesus. That is why when you have communion, what are you doing? When I partake of communion, I'm, I'm declare, when I partake of this bread, I am proclaiming the Lord's death till he come. I am not going through some ritual. I'm not going through some traditional stuff. This is not some sad thing. This is a celebration. I am proclaiming that I have a common, a common union with this broken body. I have a part in this. I was in him. And when he died, I died. And when he shed his blood, that blood has put me in, in covenant relationship with God. I am proclaiming my common union both with the body and the blood of Jesus. Expand that. I am declaring my participation in this mystery. My participation in the sacrifice of Christ. So communion becomes a declaration and a proclamation of my faith and by his stripes I'm healed. This sickness has no right in my body. It was laid upon Jesus. This came to an end and I live unto righteousness. And by his stripes I'm healed. You follow me? That is why, about, why is this so? Because of the sacrifice. Not, what you got, not only what God did for you, but what God did with you. And the Bible says in, in, in Romans chapter 6 verse 6, that that old man, that old nature was crucified with Christ. You don't have two natures. What happened is that same nature had programmed your body to behave um, selfishly. And it programmed it to be prideful and lustful. And so even though that old man is dead and crucified, and the Bible says you need to know that, even though that is the case, if you don't reprogram it's the system and put in a new program in there, then the body still wants to go in the way it was trained. You follow me? That's the reason why you renew the mind. But the way you get free is to declare the power of crucifixion in certain areas. Amen? In almost any area of personal problems and flesh issues, there's three parts to it. Number one is the application of crucifixion to whatever it is you're dealing with. Verbally, with your mouth, because the power is in your mouth. It is the preaching of the cross. It's to apply the power of crucifixion, number one. Number two, it is also to get your mind renewed to whatever the truth of the word of God concerning that particular thing you're dealing with. And then number three, right, is to also... Apply the name of Jesus because the devil will try to take advantage of you in your weaknesses. So you want to box him out. Amen? Seriously. Amen? You vulnerable in the area, the devil just say, okay, I already got him in that area, leave him. No, the devil jump on you. And then try to get you addicted, try to get you to move in, in his arena. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's move on. All right. So what did God do then? Whether, how did he do this? How is, is that he placed you in Christ? All right, now let's turn to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. I want you to see this for a moment. You know how it says in Hebrews, like it says in Hebrews in places such, such as Hebrews 10 verse 17, that their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. You ever heard about that? Why? Why is that? Because the blood of Jesus didn't just atone it. It wiped it out. Amen. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 12, I believe, says the same thing. In essence, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. All right. Let's look at, look at Revelation chapter 12 here for a moment. Verse 8, verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out. Now just get right into this scene here. Step into this environment. Step into this picture. Right? You be right in there. You're you watching this stuff. 
Amen. You got a front row seat and you're watching this. And listen to the, listen to the communication. And the great dragon was cast out. Boo! That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out in the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation. Now what kind of voice was it? A loud voice. It wasn't a whisper. You think, you think if God said a loud voice, he means a loud voice? That thing must have rattled and shake. I mean, the, some of the buildings in heaven must have started shaking. <laughs> Amen? And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation. And now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ that is anointing. Why? Because the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. What's that about? Remember in the book of Job, how, how the devil came in among the sons of God and would come and accuse, and I would come and say, God, have you, have you see Job there? Uh, your, your servant Job, right? Uh, you know, uh, oh God would say, my servant Job is a solid guy and, and so on and so forth. The devil say, yeah. Job is solid, all right. The only reason Job is solid is because you've blessed him. You've prospered him. He's the richest man out there in the East. You take away all the wealth and see if God, see if he's not going to curse you. All right? And God says, okay, all right, go ahead, test him, remove all of that. All right? But don't touch his life. Well, the devil didn't kill Job, but he killed everybody else. He killed all his family. Amen? Job stood for, for him. He didn't deny God, and as a result, he got, he got, he got a double portion in the end. But, the devil had that right at that time, and he had a case to come before God and lift up Job's shortcomings and sins. He had a right where we were concerned. But guess what? That record of our sin has now been removed. The Bible says in Ephesians, sorry, Philippians, sorry, Colossians chapter 2, 14 and 15, how Jesus has, the blood of Jesus has wiped, has not only removed that record, but it has even wiped out the handwriting in which it was written. So there is absolutely no record in heaven before the presence of God regarding anything you have ever done wrong. So the devil cannot come and say, accuse of nothing. So because that accuser is cast down and there is no record of any wrongdoing, any shortcoming, any fault before God, God just sees us through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that, what happened? Now has come salvation. Now has come strength and the kingdom of God and the power of the anointing. You understand that? This was what happened because of the sacrifice. Now, we need to know that. And it goes on to say, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their life even unto death. There was not nothing you... They, I mean, they were so... In, not self-denial. They were so dead to themselves. They were so... You see, the new man does not live for the new man. The new man lives for God. Amen? He lives for the will of God just like Jesus did. And so they loved not their life even unto death. There was no set of threat, intimidation, or anything that could move them. And they overcame him. But that's all based on what? The sacrifice of Christ. Now my question is, what did he redeem us from? What did he redeem us from? Now, number one, what, there were things that were against you. Sin was against you. Was it not? Sin was against you. But now the Bible says in Romans chapter, because that sin issue has been dealt with. Now the reason why it's important to talk about these things is because the Bible says in Philemon that your faith will work, it will produce, it will become effective by acknowledging every good thing that is in you in Christ. Your faith will produce when you recognize this is how it is, this is what is settled in heaven, and I agree. Amen? When your faith sees it the way God does and call those things the way God calls it, that is when it works. So when your faith is going to see that, wait a minute, wait a minute, this sacrifice is done. There is no accusation against me. What are you trying to bring up my sin? There is no such sin. It is dealt with. When you can recognize that all this stuff about past and you recognize it's dealt with, it is done. It is, and and you, can, you can silence that voice. Amen? So what are you redeemed from? 
What are we redeemed from? Sin has no more dominion over you, the Bible says. Because you're not under the law, but under grace. You're not operating in this arena where it's about your works and your performance and what you do and your law keeping. No, you're in this area where Jesus is, has been, where grace is provided. You're not under the law, but you're under grace. Amen? So sin can no longer dominate you. The curse of the law can no longer rule you and ruin you. Why? Because the Bible says in Galatians 3, 13 and 14 that Jesus hung up on the cross and he became a curse. Why? To redeem you from the curse of the law. Satan can no longer direct you according to his own agenda. So that you're walking according to the prince of the power of the air. That's not so anymore. Why? Because Colossians 1 verse 13 said that God has delivered you out of the kingdom of darkness and has translated you into the kingdom of his dear son. So you don't have that dominion, that authority over you. So if you try to, you just let him know, hey, bud, you don't have that authority over me anymore. Amen? But what else has he redeemed you from? Sin, dominions, Cursed dominion, the devil dominion. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 5. And this is so critical. Because this is where people's opinions will pull them right out of the realm of God's divine nature and make them live like mere normal men, Christians. This is what pulls you into carnality, where you walk according to your reasoning and your, and your feelings and, and, and what makes sense and what don't make sense. When you're supposed to be walking by faith, not sense. Amen? Hello? Revelation chapter 5. Let's pick it up in verse 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, that sacrifice, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came, and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elbows fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and, 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 and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. Because thou was slain, sacrifice, and, watch this, has redeemed us on to God. Two questions must be answered here. What are we redeemed to and what are we redeemed from? And has redeemed us on to God. We'll come back to that. Out of, out of what? Every kindred, every tongue, every people, every nation. The Amplify says, um, out of every, where are we at here? Out of every tribe, out of every tribe, out of every language, out of every people, out of every nationality. In other words, he has pulled you out of so that you are no longer to be defined by the tribe you come from. You are no longer to be defined by your ethnicity. You are no longer to be defined by your gender. You are no longer to be defined by your education, by your background, by your history, by who you know. You are no longer to be defined by any of those human yardsticks and limitations. That is what Jesus was talking about in John chapter 17, verse 14 and 16, when Jesus says, you are in the world, but what? Not of the world. What did he mean by that? You are in the world, but you are not to be defined by the world. You are not to, be, be, to have the limitations that the people in the world have. Why? You've been moved out of that system. You are dead to the world, to the body of Christ. And here you are, by the power of the Spirit of the living God, and Jesus inside of you, you can now do all things through Christ that strengthens you. Those human limitations are no longer there. But you have got to get your mind reused, renewed. Otherwise, you're going to think, this is normal. That is normal. What else can I expect? Oh, you can expect a lot different if you believe the Word of God. If you start believing you have abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. If you start recognizing that you are not, you're redeemed from those things, from those human definitions and limitations, and you're redeemed unto God. What does it mean to be redeemed unto God? What does it mean to be redeemed unto God? It means be redeemed unto God. <laughs> All right? Now, what is that? It, really, it literally means 
it's on to it's, it's, it's on to God. It's all that He is, all that He has. By the sacrifice of Christ, here's what has happened. Everything in your life has been set apart to God. The Bible says you've been sanctified forever. Hebrews 10.10. 10. You've been bought with a price. So you are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. That's why that's a good thing at communion. I'm not my own. I belong to God. That is why communion is also a place where you can make some dedications. You've been struggling in a particular area, or you particularly, you just need to make a, a consecration. I might need to come preach, and I don't want to come preach here as me. You're going to be in trouble. I don't want to just come and preach in the natural. So what do I want to do? I want to be sure that when I'm here, that it's not my words, that it, that is the testimony of God. I want to make sure that he has the freedom, the liberty, so that he can bring things to my remembrance, so that he can take me in the direction that I had not planned. And in order to do that, I've got to put myself in the right place. And one of the ways, and I'm just happened to, this has happened to come up. One of the ways I, I, I do that is by communion. Some, not, not all the time, but sometimes when, before I go preach. Why? So I, I can stop and think, that, wait a minute, I am making a declaration here. It's not me, but it's you. I'm trusting you. I'm trusting your life. I'm one with this body. This is what the blood says, etc., etc. So, so communion is also a place of dedication because you've been set apart. Everything about your life belongs to God. Everything about your life belongs to God. Hallelujah. You are in him. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Did I lose myself? Oh, okay. All right. So, and the Bible says, so you, you belong to God and everything that has been that, that, that belongs to God belongs to you because you are a joint heir with Christ and you are an heir of God. Hallelujah. I'm just trying to find myself here. All right, praise the Lord. Now, if Revelation chapter 5, not only does it say you're redeemed unto God, but verse 10 says, and he has made unto us kings and priests unto God. We are kings and priests and we should what? Reign on this earth. Reign on this earth. Now, to be, to be, to be born again, it says, in, it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, that you are born again, begotten again by the resurrection to a living hope and to an incorruptible inheritance, reserved, that faded not away. So by the resurrection, you are being born again to an infinite inheritance. This inheritance is so rich, so abundant, that it causes in Ephesians 3 verse 8, the unsearchable riches of Christ. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2, that when Jesus was raised up from the dead, the Father God made him heir over all things. All things. Let all the angels worship him. Made him an heir over everything. But guess what? Romans 8, 17 says, we are a joint heir with Christ to everything he's an heir of. So how infinite is that inheritance? How abundant is that inheritance? It already belongs to you. You've already obtained it in Christ, Ephesians 1, verse 11. How infinite is it? Ephesians 1, 3 says, every spiritual blessing. 2 Peter 1, verse 3 says, everything that pertain unto life and godliness. Romans, um, Luke, verse 17, 21 says, the kingdom of God is within you. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7 says, we've got these treasures in earthen vessels. And just in case there is anything else, Luke 12, 32, the Father says, it is his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Which means what, you can have it. <laughs> Amen? Why would God say you can have it? Because you deserve it? No, because Jesus deserves it. Amen? Jesus deserves it. That's, that's, that, I'm telling you, let that sink into your mind. It will, it will deliver you from every sense of any confidence you have in your flesh and in, and in self-righteousness and your own performance and your, and your own good looks or your own, I mean good works or, or anything like that. It will deliver you from all of that. And all you're going to be trusting is Him, what He did. I'm saved by grace. All of this is mine, not because of works of righteousness which I've done, but because of his mercy, because of what Jesus did. Hallelujah. So the inheritance is the abundance of grace. Amen? 
It's not works. Lest any man should boast. There's a scripture in Romans chapter 3 verse, verse um, 27 says something to this effect. And, and I, I like to take that and I like to combine it with, 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 with um, Hosea 10 and verse 12. Which says you sow in righteousness but you reap in mercy. In other words, I do what is right, I operate in this. But when I get a harvest, hey, it's because of the mercy of God. It's not, oh, I did it right, I did this. No, no, no. It's the mercy of God. Because everyone was on the sin and our disc was disqualified. The only thing we were qualified for was the mercy of God. <laughs> Hello? And Romans chapter 3 verse 27 says, Where then is the boasting? It's illegal. By what law? By the law of faith. Not works. Hallelujah. So you're redeemed from everything that came as a result of Adam's offense. Everything including the human limitations. Now that is what people have difficulty wrapping their minds around. Because we think, oh come on, everybody got to be sick sometime. And, and I mean, your education, I mean, you, you got to have, and I'm, I'm, I'm for education, I'm for working hard, I'm for all of those things. But those things are not supposed to define you. Those things are not supposed to. Um, those things are not supposed to define your life. Amen. God says, "I've redeemed you out of that." God wants you to look to Him and believe Him. There's a verse of Scripture in Colossians 1, verse 20. Matter of fact, flip over there. Colossians 1:20. This is a very, very significant verse. And um, I know very soon when we start talking about conflicts in the family and uh, and all of that and marriage, this is a huge verse of Scripture. Verse 20, it says, having made peace, that's wholeness, how? Through the blood of his cross. What is the blood of his cross talking about? Come on. Sacrifice. Come on, you should be identifying this now. So having made peace because of his sacrifice, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, all things unto God, whether they be in heaven or things in earth. Now listen to this logic for a moment. That verse of scripture says everything has been reconciled to God. Everything. Now if everything is reconciled to God, no ma even though it might look contrary, it might appear to be a contradiction and, or whatever, it says the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice of Christ has reconciled it. Now if it's reconciled to God and I'm an heir of God, an heir to everything he's got and it's reconciled to him and I'm his heir, it's reconciled to me. So when I look at a situation that is dysfunctional, that is contrary, that is against me, rather than agree with it and whine over it, I need to reign. How do I reign? Speak from the sacrifice. What does it say? It says, this situation, rebellious as it might look, has been reconciled unto me. So I declare peace. I declare reconciliation in the name of Jesus. I remit whatever sins need to be remitted as a priest of God. Jesus says, whatever sins you remit, they are remitted. And I begin to declare that. Amen? You see, joy is when you can rejoice for what you don't even see yet. Just because God said it. That's faith. Amen? All right. So, here God is crying out. God has a cry to, for, for, for where his church and his people are concerned. Because God knows what has been done. God knows what he has called them to. God knows that the blood of Jesus is what has qualified them for all of this inheritance, not their works. Colossians 1.12. It is the blood that makes us meet and qualify to be partaker of the inheritance of the saints in the light. So God has a cry. And I literally, just like how you hear that voice shouting, shouting in heaven. The accusers cast down and now has come salvation. Similarly, it says in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1, come up higher. And I believe God is crying out to every believer, come up higher. Come so that you can see what it is, what I am seeing. God is crying out, and he's saying, for instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse, 20, verse 34, Awake to righteousness. Awake to the reality of this oneness that you have with Christ. Awake to the rights and the privilege that you've got. Awake to the authority that is yours. Awake to the freedom and the liberty and the, and the deliverance from every shame and every condemnation. Awake to it and start letting those the truths permeate your thinking. Amen? Awake to righteousness and sin not. That means awake to that righteousness, awake to these things, and stop being separated from God. Stop coming short of the glory. 
All have sinned and come short of the glory. Awake to righteousness and sin not. Awake to righteousness and stop coming short of the glory. Don't live with a mindset of separation. Amen? Now here's the problem. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3 says this. Listen to what it says. It says, set your affections. Verse 1. If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on the things above, not on the things on the earth. You are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Here is the problem. Most believers, and if you listen to their conversations, especially outside the church, <laughs> even in church too, most believers are wrapped, I'm talking about believers, they're wrapped up and they're, 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 they're wrapped up in their humanity and it is what they think about, it's what they talk about, it's what permeates them, the elements of their humanity. Their, put it this way, their communication is earthly. Now if the Bible says, and it does say, in Psalms 50 verse 23, that if you order your conversation aright, you will see the salvation of God. And your conversation is earthly. Will you see the salvation of God? Is that conversation right? And don't forget conversation means you're thinking, you're speaking, and you're acting. To Philippians chapter 3. Let me, let, let's, so, so that Colossians 3 verse 3 says, Set your affections on the things which are above. Your life is hid with Christ and God. Now look at Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. And this is a divine health scripture. Philippians chapter 3 verse 20 says, For our conversation is in heaven. Our citizenship, our conversation, our communication, our thinking, our speaking, our actions is in heaven. From whence we are looking, look where you're looking, not at the things that are seen, we are looking for our Savior, the Lord Jesus, who shall change our vile body that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. Think about this for a moment. If Jesus on the inside of you can rise up, would your enemies be scattered? <laughs> can Jesus, does Jesus have the power and ability to so work within you to subdue everything in your life and make it obey him? Can you do that? This scripture says that when you order your conversation to line up with heaven, your speaking, your thinking, your actions, to line up with heaven, Jesus will show up and he will change your mortal body. Why would he show up and change your mortal body and get it to agree like with his glorious body? Why would he do that? Here is why he will do it. The Bible says in Hebrews 3 verse 1 that he is the apostle and the high priest of your confession. He has been authorized, sent by God, and anointed by God to bring to pass your word, your speaking, your thinking, when it lines up with his word. When it lines up with heaven, he is authorized to bring it to pass. In, in, in um, Isaiah, it says the government is on his shoulder. In Jeremiah, he says he watches over the word to perform it. It is his job to bring it to pass, not yours. Your job is to confess right, to talk right, to think right, to act right. His job is to bring the manifestation. To order your conversation. Order it. It's like a military thing. Order. So let's help order it. You, have you, ever, have you ever been in the military? They say, rise, move, left, turn, left. Oh, man. And orders. It's not suggestion. It's not suggestion. It's an order. Well, Psalms 50 verse 23 says, you need to order your conversation right. And when you do, you will see the salvation and the deliverance of God. But, what is the case? The conversation and the lifestyle of many believers living here on earth is not ordered to line up with heaven. The Bible says that if you would order your conversation to be as it is in heaven, according to Deuteronomy 11, 21, you can have days of heaven on earth. Amen? Philippians 1, 27 says, um, that you, I'm right close by, it says, it says um, only let your conversation be 
as it become the gospel. Let your conversation be in agreement with the gospel. In agreement with the fact that Jesus, that you were crucified with him, that you were buried with him, that our old man has no more rule, he is gone, he is buried. Let your conversation be in accordance to the fact that, that you were raised up together with him, you are seated with him, the blood has been shed, you are free from guilt, there is no record of your sin. Let your, to him that ordered this conversation, let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Philippians 1 27. Don't let it be, accord, be some vain conversation based on the traditions of men. Right? 1 Peter 1 verse 18 and 19. So what is the problem? What is the problem within the body of Christ? What is the problem? The problem is this. Now hear me. Hear, me, hear, I, I, hear this clearly. The problem is this. The offense of the first Adam has greater rule and influence on the lives of Christians than the perfect sacrifice of the second Adam. The offense of Adam and all of his guilt and condemnation and all of that has greater rule and greater authority in the lives of believers than the sacrifice of the second Adam. Can you see that? So as a result, guilt and shame and, 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 and you know, memories and pain and, 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 and all those human limitations, they rule instead of the love of God, instead of the peace of God, instead of the joy of the Lord, instead of the authority of the name. Human limitations instead of I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Who like you and who don't like you and what's happening in the environment rather than the fact that I'm now here and Jesus is here and I am made in this environment righteousness and I'm to set this entire atmosphere apart for God by, by you being there. The Bible says, in, in, He in us is wisdom, righteousness, sanctification and redemption. Isn't that right? So that what Jesus has done is what is the impact and rule our lives far greater than the offense of that one man. Can you see that? That is what it's talking about. When it says you will put on the garment, brother, when they put on the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness and the oil of joy for mourning, then it's obvious, it's obvious that these are the trees of righteousness planted of the Lord that he might be glorified. Amen? This is how you reign. These are, they, 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 what's coming out there? What's coming out? What's coming out? What's coming out when, it, when in the squeeze? Hello? Is it the sap? <laughs> the sap from the vine coming through the branch? You know, don't forget the fruit that bears on the branch is just the outward evidence of the inward life. And the fruit is born on the branch, not on the vine. That is why the Bible speaks about the fruits of righteousness. What comes out of living in this oneness? What comes out of operating in this authority? What comes out of having this right standing and freedom from guilt and condemnation and shame and insecurity? What comes out of having all these rights and privileges and being a joint heir with Christ and the heir of God? Amen? Instead, what happened? Carnality. Paul said... You are yet carnal, and you live as mere men. We are not to be mere men. We have a divine part on the inside of you. One third of you, your spirit man, has divinity on the inside. Your soul and your body, okay, they need some work. Amen? So that we are not to, be, we are not to walk according to the vanity of the mind, reasoning, intellect, without God. We are to be walking in the mind of Christ. Not dominated by humanity, but dominated by that divine nature that we are partakers of. Are you with me? Blessed be the name of the Lord. So, I think we need to fix this problem, don't you? How are we going to fix it? And this is where we're going to go in the second half. How are we going to fix it is this. Here are the aspects of righteousness. Once you are clear of what those aspects of righteousness are, right standing with God, meaning no shame, no guilt, 
No insecurity, no inferiority, no condemnation. Right standing with God because you're justified as if sin has never been, been because of the grace and the blood by faith. When you understand that's what righteousness is, when you understand that righteousness is authority that activates the kingdom of God, when you understand that rights is rights and privileges, when you understand that, 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 um, that, that righteousness is that oneness with him, he that is joined to the Lord is one, vine and the branch, one, Head and body, one. When you understand these things about righteousness, and then you look over here, and you recognize that this is what the sacrifice of Christ is. It's his, it's, it's his, it's his crucifixion, it is burial, it's his resurrection, it is ascension, it's his shed blood, it is his name, it is his life in us, and it is these great and precious promises by which we are partakers of the divine nature. Then the question simply comes, how do I become established in righteousness? How do these items, these aspects of the sacrifice produce each and every one of these and you can look at every one of them and just ask the question what does the blood say what does the name say what does the life of christ in me say what does crucifixion say what does burial say what does resurrection say what does ascension say i'm seated in heavenly places hallelujah are you with me so that's what we got to do in the second half and then we put those two together and then when you leave here today you will know how to apply the sacrifice of christ so that you can be established in righteousness and the bible says when you are established in righteousness you will be far from oppression because you shall not fear and no weapon formed against you will prosper every tongue that rises up against you in judgment you'll shut it down why because this is the heritage for the inheritance of the servants of God. If that belonged to the servants of God, I believe the sons of God have greater rights. 